Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on the uh, time zone you are. Uh, welcome to the first webinar of this biennium of the Wonka uh, Special Interest Group on Policy Advocacy. And our webinar today is uh, Learning from Policies that Work, a conversation with leaders. Uh, it's a pleasure to host you today, myself and uh, Professor Amanda How is uh, joining uh, the co-chair of the uh, Special Interest Group on Policy Advocacy with me. Uh, we have two great speakers with us. Uh, you all know uh, Anna Savdal, immediate, immediate past Wonka president, and also Florian Hughes. Uh, from the USA, uh, and again, uh, uh, a leader in policy. And we also have uh, Pilar with us. Uh, Pilar is from, the, from, from Spain and also representing the Wonka Executive Committee as a member, member at large. And she's helping with us. Uh, we are trying, we are experimenting something special today. For the first time, uh, we are experimenting the captioning option uh, in Spanish mainly, but also Pilar is helping with Spanish, but also uh, we will tell if you are uh, uh, if you are if you like to use any other language, whatever it is. I think there are about twelve languages that you can have captioning. Uh, so you can have translations as captions on your screens. You have already enabled that. And I will ask first Pilar to introduce that. And then I will go to the speakers. Pilar. Uh, thank you very much, Pilar. And uh, Pilar will be available for. Yeah, uh, I, I will keep an eye on the chat in case there are any issue. And please. Uh, Bear with us, we are experimenting this time. And if this is a success, we can be more inclusive in future. So if there's any issue, let us know. Uh, I mean, uh, you can just uh, message us or let us know in the chat if there's any problem. So we will introduce our speakers now. Uh, I would like to invite our speakers to introduce themselves which is better. Anna, first. Hello, everyone. Um, organizers, thank you for the invitation. Uh, participants, very good to see many familiar faces and also get to new, know new ones. Um, I'm a family doctor in Oslo, Norway, university teacher and the immediate past president of Wonka. I followed the, this group uh, from the start with interest, but this is the first time I've had the opportunity to, to attend a meeting. So I'm looking forward. Thank you, Anna. Laurie? Thank you, Sanka. Good morning, everyone from Denver. It is good to see you and some faces that I had a chance to meet um, in Sydney. And Amanda and Sanka, thank you for uh, the opportunity to join Anna on uh, the conversation um, this morning. I'm a family physician. I work in a rural uh, clinic north of Denver, and I'm also uh, faculty at the University of Colorado, where I do health policy research and teaching and consultative work across a, a number of different uh, topical areas. And I am currently the immediate past chair um, of the American Board of Family Medicine here in the US. And we are the organization that sets certification standards for family physicians um, here uh, in this country. So nice to um, see you all. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. We know that you are just after a holiday. So still, thank you for, thank you for uh, attending the meeting without any problem. Yeah. Amanda, would you like to go ahead from this point? Well, I think we are, you know, going to invite our speakers to speak. But yes, thank you, Sanka. So people will probably know me. I am uh, was president of Wonka at one point. I'm co-chair 
of this uh, SIG with Sanka at the present time. And I'm very pleased that so many people have joined us. And then we hope that we can also share the webinar afterwards and matters that arise through the portal and keep present at the conferences as well. So very nice to be here. Um, and shall we perhaps go to our first speaker? So uh, inviting Anna, the way that the meeting will work, I should say, you know, we're going to have our speakers 10 to 15 minutes each. Then we will uh, host some questions and answers direct to them. And then we will have hopefully a discussion in the group. We may split into breakout rooms, I think, because we're quite a big group. And uh, finishing hour and a half length of the meeting, a little bit longer if we need it. Uh, and we will come back together, of course, in time to summarize your views and take things forward. So thank you very much. Um, Anna. Okay, I'll call this presentation Speak Out. Um, inspired by a poster. approved by the five Nordic colleges in 2023. This is from the, a textbook in family medicine uh, pointing to 2023. Um, this poster uh, described how we define the principles of, of general practice family medicine, the five Nordic countries, and is a policy document in itself, but not my topic for this talk. But I'll I want to attract your attention to the sixth principle in this poster. It states, we recognize that social strain, deprivation, and traumatic experiences increase people's susceptibility to disease, and we speak out on relevant issues. Speak out. Advocacy, in other words. So, for clarification, I looked up this definition of a policy. According to Oxford languages, a policy is a course or principle of action adopted or proposed by an organization or individual. Speaking advocacy. In other words, for me, I know Laureen will give us some general views on advocacy and, and, and policies later. But another word for implementation of policies, there are some requirements for success. We need a clear vision, a convincing narrative, authentic leadership, public engagement, and adequate available resources. I will now tell you a story about a policy which started way back in time, but which succeeded and still has impact because it is maintained and followed up on. In 2005, this manifestation was published on a full page in one of Norway's big, biggest newspapers. 200 signatures of people in the Norwegian public health care public working in the field of healthcare and medicine, um, including the newly passed health director of Norway, heads of academic departments, scientists, high profile people from public debate and from public health. Our vision was stated in the headline. It said, we are physicians against increased commercialization and corruption. And we gave some advice to politicians and decision makers, health authorities and the Norwegian Medical Association. Our narrative was elaborated on in the text, and don't try, try to use this automatic translation <laughs> for this, I will explain. Uh, we were referring to the per Paris Declaration, which described increased corruption in decisions made by the few, affecting the many. Our reasoning? We physicians depend on trust in our clinical work, in research and in education. And we manage huge collective resources through our clinical decisions. So our concern was that professional activities increasingly were under influence of commercial actors 
at risk of undermining the humanistic foundation of our role. That is what's described in the text. This trend also contributed, contributes to increased medicalization, overdiagnosing, and overtreatment. Our advice went in short around raising awareness among health personnel about how current trends impact development of medicine and also discussing the important role doctors have. Ultimately, we wanted to make sure that regulations were in place to prevent professional corruption. The timing was not chosen by, by on random. Later the same month, the Norwegian Medical Association should discuss and then approve of a new set of rules for collaboration between physicians and big pharma and other commercial agents. I'll get back to the outcome, but first let's do the list. I said clear vision. We had a clear vision uh, represented in the main sentence, doctors against, etc. The narrative was the description of how commercial forces increasingly increasingly were impacting our professional activities. Yeah, I'll I'll um, I'll um, I'll remain there for a while. Did we have an authentic leadership? Let me explain who we were. The initiative sprang out of a group of 12 female family doctors, the 12 Qs. We had a sort of a think tank at that time. I had just stepped down as president for the Norwegian College of General Practice, and a key issue for me in my time on the board was the risk of professional corruption through golden strings, stronger and stronger golden strings between doctors and big pharma, which also led to a role in a Norwegian television documentary on the topic just before this call for action. So the 12 cues were women from all of healthcare, um, primarily related to family medicine and public health. Our leadership was based on a common value base and firmly consolidated on that. And together we had a very broad network in all of healthcare and related fields. And you know, Norway is a small country, so also the public sphere is, is rather small compared compared to many countries. So together we were quite well connected. We put down a list of names we wanted to invite to join this call for action. We shared the names among us, contacted them and gave them just a few days to decide if they wanted their signature included. If they did, they also had to donate a sum to cover the cost for the ad. We had already negotiated a price with the newspaper uh, and a good friend would do the layout pro bono. So over a short week, we needed to act fast uh, to avoid sort of, um, yeah, reactions. So let me get back to that. Budget on the parts of those who would not welcome this message were far more generous than ours. They were also equipped with human resources in marketing, for example. So we wanted this to come as a surprise. A media strategy was developed. We contacted affiliated people in newspapers, radio, TV, and were ready to shoot the moment it was published. Norway is a country with strong cultural notions of fairness and collective responsibility for public services. So we expected the public to react positively, and by and large, they did. So editorials, comments, essays, interviews, and debate took place over the next couple of weeks. And that was good building up to the Medical Association's meeting. What were the reactions from Big Pharma? Predictable also partly from secondary care uh, colleagues. First, denial, silence, then anger, offense, condemnation. How could we allow ourselves to indicate that colleagues could be professionally corrupt? It is a hard word, but it worked. 
okay, support is what we experienced, I mean, in the in the longer run. Um, and we received many reactions from people, including colleagues who didn't want to go public. Um, now what is called currently is called cancelling from platforms, didn't exist at that time. Uh, but group discipline and, and social control are not new phenomenons. The issues raised became the topics for debates and we were very happy. So we could go to that Medical Association General Assembly quite well prepared. So we sparked this uh, discussion and we raised awareness. The most important, uh, yeah, and what was the defense? Collaboration, also predictable. Collaboration is important. We are all in the same boat. I mean, from big pharma, from other colleagues, uh, pharma money necessary to fund research and professional development. And pharma provides invaluable contributions to medical education and CPD. So those were also on the agenda for the discussions. The most important outcome, however, was that the ground was prepared for the debate at the General Assembly. The end result, the strictest set of rules for collaboration between physicians and big pharma ever seen, I think also to date. Maybe the most important part, no CPD accreditation for educational activities sponsored by big pharma. But it also included uh, restrictions and rules for to secure transparency regarding pharma-sponsored research. I would have lied if I said everything was fine. There was a lot of grumbling, and I'm 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 happy. We 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 were not in the same social media um, environment we are uh, currently. Um, I was one of the spokespersons for the campaign, and I was known for raising the issue over many years, not least as president of the college, and that didn't bring friends only, uh, but more friends than enemies. Silence and attempts to ignore us, uh, don't. it didn't work as domination techniques in the longer run, um, which I think has transition value to, to other uh, examples. If the case is good and there are enough people to support and defend it, it will actually have some impact. But patience is also needed. This spread first to the Nordic Federation of Family Medicine, which owns the Scandinavian Journal of Primary Healthcare and the biannual Nordic Congresses. The Federation was established in 2005 and I was also its, its first president. And of course, natural for me to take this issue to the Nordic collaboration. And in 2007, we had the first almost pharma-free conference, um, Nordic conference in Iceland. Now the Congress is run without any pharma support. Next step was our European community. Since 2013, we defined the same goal for the Wonka conferences. And in Copenhagen in 2016, the first pharma-free Wonka conference took place in Copenhagen. So far, so good. Let's revisit um, the process. I think we, in large parts, fulfill the requirements I listed for you, including adequate resources. And mind you, it was not financial resources, first of all. It was human resources and a well-consolidated yet diverse enough group, but with shared ideas and goals. We came from different directions into the same issue, well-connected to different parts of healthcare. We planned on all levels and steps of the process. How did the policy fare and what is the state of affairs now? For Wonka Europe, I'm afraid there has been a reverse move since 2016. The London conference in 2022 may be not a good example where pharma were deep into the conference. I know that this issue will be raised in Wonka Europe Council this year, 
Because even if people understand that funding is important, I feel there is a common understanding of the potential reputational risk for Wonka and for our professionality if pharma involvement is not strictly regulated. What about the global arena? Of course, we were not the only ones in the world who put this issue on the agenda back then. In our global community, Big Pharma's involvement in Wonka activities was perceived increasingly problematic. The approach I just have described has increasingly also been implemented in Wonka. So the organization Wonka has put thick firewalls between pharma and individuals, if pharma money at all is accepted. As for now, we have a few projects which is partly funded by pharma, but with very clear framework and no pharma influence on the content. I know from where I'm speaking, uh, the situation in many countries is very different when it comes to funding of education, resilience of health systems compared to my region and my country. So vulnerability to professional corruption is variable throughout the world. Primary care and training for primary care are subject to influence by societal trends and developments and the financial system in the individual countries. I'm very well aware of that. So um, I know we were in and we are in a favorable situation. Um, welfare and health systems based on, on social cohesion, equity and solidarity. That's the bedrock of the systems. So that makes it also easier to address fundamental questions like this in, in a system like ours. But I think there are potential learnings to take from this story. And our global network, Wonka, can support member organizations to develop strategies to be more independent of pharma money. Synergies is maybe a key word here, but this is up for discussion and I am looking forward to listen and hear your views. So thank you so much for your attention so far. Thank you very much, Anna. Bravo. Um, very interesting example about different levels of groups embracing a policy and then other things shifting it and the recurrence of the themes. And of course, what you highlighted, that it makes a difference what your primary values are. So we often say both in leadership, you can do very effective leadership for very bad purposes. And you can have policies that are aligned with different sets of values in an organization. So really interesting. Um, colleagues, we were planning to go straight to our second speaker so we could find the synergies between the two. Um, but so unless anybody has anything they are really unclear about, if you are, if there's something you really want to clarify, then speak. Otherwise, we will go on to Lauren. And just to comment one small thing, I noticed that the translation mainly has a problem with the word Wonka. So, <laughs> but other than that, it's going well. So thank you, Anna. Um, Lauren, please continue. Thank you. Sounds good. And Amanda, just to sound and check, and you can see the slides, okay, correct? Okay, thank you. Um, well, what a pleasure uh, to follow um, Anna and uh, certainly hope um, that what I'll share today will be complimentary. And I can tell from what she just shared that there will be a lot of synergies in many ways between what she just um, shared and what I hope to convey as well. Um, a couple of notes before um, I jump in and I'm going to hit start on my stopwatch so I can keep close to keep close to time. Um, the first is I would like uh, to acknowledge that my colleagues um, in the Farley Health Policy Center, where I'm based at the University of Colorado, um, as the Farley Center, we are nonpartisan and we are an objective policy research analysis and translation um, center. And my colleagues that you see listed at the bottom of the slide 
much of the content that I'm sharing today has been co-developed with them, and I want to give them a proper um, credit um, for uh, their contributions to um, this content. And the other um, acknowledgement um, that I'll make from the beginning is that, you know, I am presenting from what I know, which is a U.S.-based context, and a lot of the policy work um, that I do is uh, pertinent to how we organize finance and deliver health and health care um, in this country. And so I certainly hope that some of what I'll share will be applicable to you and your contexts and look forward to discussing those differences um, later on during our webinar today. So starting with a definition that in many ways is complementary to the one that um, Anna shared. This is not um, an officially coined definition of health policy, but this is one that has been a cumulative definition that we um, have developed as a team in the Farley Center and that I often um, use, which is thinking about the work of policy as the work of moving people and systems from ideas to action, with the ultimate goal of improving health and promoting wellness. So what does policy look like in action? And, and I'm not sure if this is an experience that you have had, but sometimes when I talk about health policy with my colleagues, they look scared or their eyes glaze over, they're not sure what I'm talking about, or they think I'm talking about politics, and there can be a fair amount of confusion. And I take a broad view on policy. And so these are different activities from my experience of what policy looks like in action. This might involve researching evidence to inform policy design, implementation, or evaluation. This might be convening stakeholders and decision makers to solve problems together. Uh, this might, being a, might be being a key informant um, to inform legislation or regulation or educating and mentoring professionals to think about health policy impacts or implications in the work that, that, that you are doing. And so if you think about these different um, bullet points, and this is not a complete list, but you may think about or identify the work that you do as aligning with some of these different bullet points. I would argue that you may in fact be engaging in health policy work, but you may not have been thinking about it in that context. At the end of the day, why I love policy, teaching it, practicing it, et cetera, is that policy skills are tools to make your studies findings if you are engaged in research or your clinical practice um, experience actionable, which is really uh, important to move health change forward. A couple of notes about policy versus advocacy versus lobbying. I often find that in my context, these terms, particularly policy and advocacy, can get confused or conflated um, with one another. In the Farley Center, we think about policy as the work of really digging in and understanding the problem it is that you're trying to solve and the work of analyzing, designing, or researching a wide variety of potential solutions to those problems. That's how we think about the work of policy. When you move into advocacy, you certainly can take that policy research or analysis, those products to inform your advocacy work, but advocacy often involves, as you heard from Anna's example, educating stakeholders or decision makers, or asking them to move in a particular uh, direction, which builds upon policy, but is a distinct set of activities. And um, in the US, particularly when it comes to health and healthcare, our, um, if you are a registered lobbyist, healthcare lobbyist, um, you will be active in uh, specifically influencing specific pieces of proposed legislation at the state or the federal level, either in direct support or um, opposition. So a couple other um, thoughts about um, policy. I have a, the, my next slide will talk about different levels of influence. You can be engaged in policy work at the individual patient level, all the way to the international um, level as we are um, in Wonka. 
Um, a little uh, note about little p versus big p policy. This is not a, a judgment statement or to say that one type of policy is more or less important than the other. In the Farley Center, when we talk about little p policy, we are referring to organizational or clinical level policy and procedural changes. If we think back to those early days of COVID where our clinical delivery systems or clinics were changing policies, sometimes on a daily basis um, early on, um, that could be considered little p policy. We think about big P policy more so in the realm of legislation or regulation um, at the state or the federal level. To be engaged in policy, one does not have to be working in or for government in some capacity. I'm currently in an academic um, environment and I'm working on policy. I've had experiences in the past working um, with foundations, associations, uh, membership organizations, advocacy organizations, and I've done policy work in all of those different uh, contexts and settings. And then another way to think about policy is to think about your um, issues of interest. And right now, I don't know about you, but my list of things I want to fix in health and healthcare would go on for pages and pages and pages. So important to pick an issue that you are passionate about and willing to be patient about the typical change. In my career, the issues that I care about, including improving primary care, financing and payment, improving how we deliver um, uh, health care in rural um, communities and settings. These are things I'm not going to fix overnight by any means. These are are issues that I'll be dedicating my career to fixing uh, and improving in, in one way or another. Um, but these are issues that I care deeply about that will continue to move me forward um, on days where the policy work can be uh, challenging. So this was the levels of influence um, slide that I talked about um, on the previous, on the previous um, slide. The big take home points here are to think about um, which level of influence do you wish to or intend to make your policy change effective? Again, that could be at the individual level. In my clinical context, I have to spend a fair amount of time um, going to going to bat, so to speak, for my patients with their insurance companies to get them the care that they need. And so I'm working on policy, and in this case too, advocacy, on behalf of my patient or that family at kind of that individual um, level. Here in Colorado with the Farley Center, I'm uh, very engaged at the state level, but I also serve on committees uh, where I have more of a federal um, outlook on improving um, primary care. The bullet points that you see on the right side, again, will be applicable primarily, I anticipate, in the U.S. Um, context. But at each of these different levels, whether you're working at the clinic or your health system, um, level, community, state level, et cetera, there are different levers of change that you have available to you to impact um, and formulate um, policy. If I were just to um, highlight a couple of examples at the state level um, in you know, Colorado, certainly we can make health policy change through legislation or through ju uh, judicial actions. Um, but also through how we set the state budget related to health and health care. That's another way to affect change um, in health policy. So I won't uh, go into, just because of time, go into detail um, on uh, these definitions. You'll have these slides available um, afterward. But as I think about health policy over the years, this is how I have broken down health policy into different skill sets analyzing policy, how to conduct policy mapping, essentially how to do a landscape analysis of the policy implications of the issues that you care about, either from a research or a clinical perspective, how to do policy relevant research, how to, and Anna was speaking about this toward the end of her presentation, how to strategically disseminate your clinical experience or your research findings to influence policy, and then it's one thing to research or design policy. It's another thing entirely to roll up your sleeves and implement it in the real world. And so how do you operationalize um, policy? 
Um, these are certainly different topic areas that in the future would be happy to um, speak more about um, at, at future webinars if useful. So now I'll share a brief um, story from um, a policy that I was responsible for overseeing its implementation in my previous role. Um, prior to coming to University of Colorado, um, I served as a Deputy Secretary of Health um, in the Pennsylvania Department of Health. This would be akin to being like a Deputy Health Minister in other contexts, but I was in our public health department um, in state government in Pennsylvania, where at the time, and we still are facing um, an opioid and heroin epidemic crisis um, in the U.S. When I was in state service in Pennsylvania from 2015 to 2019, the crisis um, had really reached a, a particularly bad peak. And the governor was intent on trying to address um, this issue. One of the policy solutions was to create what we refer to as a prescription drug monitoring program. This is a database that uh, includes um, information about the dispensation of controlled substances um, as we categorize those um, in the US. This is a database that as a physician prescribing or considering prescribing controlled substances or as a pharmacist that dispenses those controlled substances before uh, prescribing or dispensing, we can look at this database to identify any red flag behaviors. So if a patient is getting prescriptions from multiple um, clinicians or getting prescriptions filled at multiple pharmacies, these may be red flags for addiction or diversion of these different substances. I was responsible for overseeing um, the implementation of this program. And this is a snapshot of the first page of the law. It took the Pennsylvania General Assembly or our elected officials seven years uh, to pass this law. And my first day on this job, my boss, the Secretary of Health or the Minister of Health in Pennsylvania, handed me this 11-page law and said, make this a reality. And I said, wonderful. I've never done this before, but we will figure it out. And I had a great team. So the ultimate goal of this particular policy was to help clinicians make informed um, prescribing decisions and to aid regulatory and law enforcement agencies in Pennsylvania with combating fraud, abuse, and diversion. That was the ultimate goal as listed in the legislation. And so that was my, that was my vision. That was the vision that was uh, enshrined in the legislation. So how did I implement that on the ground with my team? In the first year, I focused my team on building a reliable database. I knew that if the data in that database wasn't reliable, that physicians or pharmacists using it would not trust anything else that we would do, educational programs or otherwise, coming out of our office if it was not a reliable um, tool. Pennsylvania was very late to the party. We were the 49th state um, to pass uh, this legislation. And so the good thing is we didn't have to reinvent the wheel. We could learn from other states, we could reach out to technical assistance centers. We could review the literature. And so I guided my team with my research background, research and policy background, guided my team um, to practice evidence-based um, policy um, to move this um, forward. Uh, so this was a picture of me with longer hair uh, back in the day in August of 2016 when it was the official public launch of um, the prescription drug monitoring um, program. By the time I departed state service three years later, we had enrolled over 110 clinicians in this tool um, to use it. We secured nearly $7 million in federal funds to support additional um, educational um, programs. Um, I initially hired one person, my director, that reported to me. By the time I left, we had hired almost 30 individuals uh, to help um, advance this program. And I'm so very proud of my team that I worked with that was selected for a Governor's Award um, of Excellence um, for their service on this particular um, program. So a couple of last thoughts as I am coming up on uh, time here for my portion. As I think about health policy work, 
Um, I see so many parallels um, between how family physicians are trained clinically, how we think, how we act, what we do. And that skill set translates to important skills needed to make health policy change. I'll just highlight um, a couple of options here, a couple of thoughts here. Family physicians, um, we are comfortable navigating complexity and ambiguity in the clinical context, right? So when our patients come to us and say, I've been dizzy for three years, or I've had this abdominal pain for five months, right? That's not exactly straightforward, right? And so navigating that complexity and ambiguity is something that we are good at. And so that translates into healthcare being very complicated and tedious, often in new territories. And so being comfortable with complexity mm -hmm. and ambiguity is really helpful when you're trying to navigate a complex um, and ambiguous health policy um, environment. Um, I'll mention one other here, um, that we know how to work well in teams in primary care and in family medicine or as general practitioners. And absolutely, you need to have stakeholder buy-in that's crucial for change um, in health policy. So just a couple of thoughts. Again, you'll have these to take a look at. Um, a couple of policy um, lessons learned in the work that I have um, done. I want to highlight um, a couple of these that relate to and enforce, reinforce what Anna um, shared. Um, crafting meaningful policy, so critical to have a vision for change. Where are you going right, as a group? Um, fostering trust at every turn, being an honest broker about what you know and what you don't know, right? That would be really important. And then a couple of thoughts from the bottom um, section here, learning how to clearly communicate to policy audiences. One of the terms we use in the Farley Center often is what we call anecdata, a combination of anecdote or story and data. That's not a real term. I think someone long before me coined it, but we love to borrow and use this anecdata term. Stories, I wish that health policy change could be made entirely with the, with the cold hard facts. That is not inspirational. That is not what grabs people. That is not what helps set priorities or get focuses the attention of our policymakers. Stories hook us in. So it's a, that it's an art of blending stories um, and data and being as clear, simple, and straightforward as possible about the problem and your suggested solutions is um, very critical. And the last thing I will share um, here, because this also connects to what Anna shared, um, policy requires appreciating the difference between the policy you're trying to formulate and the political context in what you're trying to do that work. Policy and politics are not the same thing, but they are very um, uh, dynamic and interrelated. They certainly impact um, one another. And if you are interested in policy work, um, this will be a good thing for you if you are a patient person, right? Policy does not change overnight. Uh, again, if you are willing to be persistent, if there is something that really gets under your skin and bothers you and you cannot sleep at night because you want to see it changed, that's probably a good topic for you to focus on. And perspective, being willing to listen and hear out other people that have different perspectives than you will really elevate um, your standing as someone that can be trusted and can be an honest broker because you are willing to be a team player. And that's very important. Um, and very good. Last I'll share, and again, you'll have this contact information for me if I can be helpful. This QR code will take you to um, some policy publications that our team produces every week, um, if that would be of interest to anyone um, on the webinar. And with that, um, I will stop. And Amanda, I appreciate your patience with a couple of extra minutes. Thank you. You are very welcome, Lauren. And again, thank you also for that uh, excellent talk and many synergies. I mean, it's always a question in a webinar like this, colleagues, how much we spend time hearing from people with real experience and expertise and how much time we spend interacting with that material but hopefully that wasn't too long i didn't find that too long i hope so that's great um 
what we said earlier and greetings to colleagues who've joined us late we have just you know finished the two core speakers um what we proposed to do for the second part of the webinar was to allow people to ask key questions so if there is something that you didn't understand from what anna or lauren said or something you really want to pick up and query then let us do that now while we are still all together and then after that because we have 40 people on the webinar which is brilliant um we think we will split up for 20 minutes perhaps in breakout rooms to allow people to have a bit more discussion about how this applies to them and then come back together now, to ask a question of either Anna or Lauren, um, we will try to see if you can put up your yellow hands on the toolbar. Okay, uh, Michael from yes. Canada. Hi, great. Uh, thanks. Great, great talks for those who don't know me, Mike Green. I'm the president of the College of Family Physicians of Canada. I also run a big policy research uh, group here in Ontario. Um, question for, for both, both of you, uh, maybe uh, Lauren, you kind of commented on this. Um, any thoughts on navigating between those levels of engagement on policy? So, uh, uh, you know, as a researcher, I engage at that kind of policy trusted partner thing we've got you know a decades long partnership provide data to the people behind the scenes but as college president i'm a registered lobbyist pushing certain kind of policies and and any thoughts on how you go back and forth between those those levels of the policy spectrum when you're trying to move something forward because you know you never get it all in in one lane um anna i can jump in first and then have you follow um, that's a great question. And I think it it's going to, you know, it's going to evolve over time based on um, what is the the scope of the problem that you're trying to solve. So once you identify that, um, how wide is the issue you're trying to solve and how many populations does it does it impact? And also to understand and map out who was otherwise working in this space. Um, and so that will, uh, kind of impact the scope of the work um, that you that you do. And in terms of moving from, you know, across levels, I think of that as being very fluid. And so you may need to, you know, um, expand um, and think at a broader level or uh, drill down um, to, um, uh, you know, a different level depending on um, the problem and who is working on that, who has decision making authority um, and what which level are they sitting, you know, sitting at um, what kind of access to resources or political will um, is there what work has already been done um, at that, um, you know, particular um, level and where you are able to identify a coalition of, of folks um, to help you. But at the basic level, it is what is what is the scope of problem you're trying to solve? what are the policy levers that make the most sense to advance that problem and where is that going to you know line up if you're trying to solve a problem at the wrong level with not the with the incorrect policy lever you're going to run into a log jam and so um, the policy mapping exercise that I referenced um, is an exercise that we walk through to help people identify the right level and the right types of levers um, to work on to make sure all of that is um, is matched up. So those would be some of my initial thoughts. Anna, other things that you would, mm. that you would I, have? I, I submit to what you're saying. Um, and I want to... to to share a principle I'm sure you are familiar with many of you, and that is the KISS principle. Keep it simple, stupid. I mean, if we as advocates, uh, family doctors around the world, we, we see here's something's wrong here, or I want to change this. It's not brain surgery. Uh, I was also told that brain surgery is not that difficult, but that was a side comment. But to start with the small steps to identify as you so beautifully 
outlined, Lauren, to to identify the problem, um, also identify your own uh, resources to bring it to someone, make allies, etc. So starting and for for most of us, I think family doctors around the world, we can do advocacy, efficient advocacy where we are. So I would. If I should give one advice, uh, it would be to start where you are in the context in which you are. And then you can see if you can move up the up the ladder, so to say, to the bigger context. Also, because what you said, again, about persistence and patience, that is absolutely also my, my experience. Uh, so uh, it works. Like yeast, if you just if you have a good message and you stick to that, it will also spread. That's all. Thank you. May I add a comment that also may take us into the discussion? Is that okay? Because in in our college, Michael, in the UK Royal College of GPs. We often go up and down the levels to make policy. So because we're a membership organization and in the discussion, I think we will want to say, how does your Wonka member organization make and use policy? You know, we will have some ideas in a policy group, in a leadership group uh, about what matters and what the priorities are and you know, try to be clear about why we think that, but then we will take it to the members to consult or to have some grassroots discussion, maybe even with patients as well, to check that our, you know, ideas have authenticity. And then that will be fed back up, as it were, to produce a resource, a clear statement, and then that will be dispersed out again. I won't say down, but out, you know, so that people can start to use those messages themselves in their place. And the college itself may be doing it at like a government level or with other colleges, other specialties, you know how it works. I think the Canadian College is probably the same, but it's sort of up and down the level to give the cycle of awareness, of learning, and that authentic voice so that members say, oh yeah, when the chair said that to the prime minister, I remember her already talking about that. And it gives that, you know, permission, so. Amanda, one other thing I just thought of that I'll add here too, is that changing levels, let's say you're working on an issue at your, your clinic or hospital system level, and, all of a sudden you recognize that, you know, in my context, there are state policy leaders that now this becomes like a hot topic that they're concerned about, right? That opens up a window to now have those conversations and advance policy change at the state level. And so sometimes changing levels of where you're focusing your intent to make policy change means being nimble um, and being willing to um, adjust your your strategies and the focus and locus of your conversation based on different policy windows opening up um, at different levels. And so that's another, um, uh, and that's what makes I know, policy work for me exciting and it keeps you on your toes. So. Great, thank you. Pilar would like to make a comment, I think. Thank you very much to all. <laughs> this is really a pleasure. And I've been um, I've been just um, watching the the chat um, and all people are really enthusiastic with the um, two presentations. Uh, and there are um, a lot of comments uh, that uh, support the the main messages um, made by Anna and Lauren, uh, particularly in Spanish. so great. And well, I just want to thank you both of you because you really uh, make a wide perspective of what policy advocacy was, but at the same time, uh, share your own experience uh, doing policy advocacy. And that is uh, a key element for the rest uh, to be involved in and try 
uh, with persistency and with a good message uh, to go on uh, working for family medicine and primary healthcare. That's true that sometimes we look to the window and we see many, many things uh, to work for, but it's, it's really important to focus on uh, a small area and start working, uh, engaging our stakeholders, patients, other colleagues that can reach small um, goals uh, attained and then summing up the different goals of different uh, groups to have a big change for, for all. So mm -hmm. thank you very much for your uh, presentations and speaking. Bilal, you know, I think we, we do have, have another um, question in the chat yes. um, from Monica, which I've translated. It says, in your experience, what influence does civil society have? So often we see ourselves as family doctors as being, you know, the voice of our communities, you know, the ones who are recognized perhaps as having some professional authority. But in terms of making the sorts of policies you raised guys you know how much actually has that been driven by what uh, monica is calling civil society shall i try to comment on that uh, it depends on what you mean with civil society you mean the general public general society because civil society in some contexts refer to organizations like wonka right for example with with the who but I think if if I answer the question as if it was meant the general public, what what role it it plays? Um, a strange thing looking at because health is so important to people. We had a situation here in Norway. You know, Norway is a very long country, and up north um, there are long distances uh, to hospitals, and people are very dependent on having their local hospital to provide acute care, emergency care, um, and a lot of stories. And now the authorities are looking at how to save money, also in the name of equity throughout the, the country to have equal access to specialist care. So people up north should have the same access to very specialized care on the cost of the local hospitals. People go out in the streets with torch manifestations fighting for their hospitals because they see um, they see that it's a threat. I mean, we can die tomorrow if, if the hospital was not working. For us as family doctors, and here comes, maybe it's, it's a little bit on the side of, of the question, but the, the role of civil society, the general public, it's on us to educate also uh, the public as to how important it is to have doctors and primary care providers who work, I mean, continuous with the population and with the individuals. So I'm, I haven't seen it yet, but I would have hoped that we could manage to, to have the public also walk, walk in processions, torch processions to say, we will protect and we need also primary care. Uh, and I think because what happened with in Narvik, a um, small town up north where the hospital, it was on the plan to shut down emergency services after these manifestations and the media uh, attention, government changed the decision. So they have their hospital so far i mean for another five or ten years but yeah so the role is extremely important to educate and also to reach out to the public and that is maybe not with the usual policy dialogue words but other words the anecdata i like that word thank you lauren <laughs> You're welcome, and you certainly won't find anecdata in the, the dictionary anywhere, I think, um, but I think it's a, an effective strategy. Um, I'll add a couple other thoughts, and Monica, thank you very much um, for then this we'll really discussion after that. 
Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. No, thank you, Monica, for this really important um, question. And I'll pick up with what um, Anna was saying around our role in educating patients, families, and communities about how health and healthcare works. That's really important. It's exhausting work um, because it is how we organize, finance, and deliver health and healthcare particularly in the US is very, very complex. And it's a black box. And it is, every one of us has a different perspective or a different slice of understanding on how this process works. But to the extent that we can provide education, um, you know, beyond just the clinical care context is really important. When I think about the civil society as was raised in the question, my mind immediately went to sort of patients and families and involving their voices and their stories in policy change. And relative to the example that I shared, um, you know, on the prescription drug monitoring program, it was really, uh, well, and just more broadly, the opioid and heroin epidemic in Pennsylvania, you can absolutely believe that patients and families that have been impacted by the disease of addiction were front and center with the media, front and center with advocacy organizations, front and center with elected officials. It is hard to turn your attention away. If you are an elected lawmaker, uh, to turn your attention away from a mother or a father, brother, sister, that is testifying in front of you that they lost a loved one to um, the disease of addiction or to overdose. It is hard to turn your attention away. And so engaging patients and families to share their personal experiences, number one, centers us in patient-centered policy change, as we're all trying to be patient-centered in how we deliver primary care. But it also raises the bar in terms of the urgency um, and the need to act. And so patients and families engaging them and the broader public in important healthcare um, issues, one invites them to the table as really important um, stakeholders, um, but also is incredibly strategic from the point of view of garnering the attention of elected officials and holding their feet um, to the fire because they are the constituents that might be voting for them or not in the next election, right? So it's a an accountability uh, mechanism as well. Excellent. And we've often said in our, you know, SIG teaching sessions, if you like, that people, you go somewhere and people say, well, you would say that you're a family doctor. We'd expect you to say that. If the patients say it, people listen differently. So great. Thank you so much. Um, Another question that came was not a comment in the chat earlier. He now said, sometimes stakeholders don't want to hear what we're saying. So I think that's a good challenge for the breakout rooms. What we thought, as we said, colleagues, that we would do to give you some airspace for maybe 20 minutes or so is to go into some breakout rooms. And, uh, and you know, the question we were particularly going to ask was, how can how does it work with Wonka for you? You know, how do you feel that as a family doctor, you can, you know, your Wonka membership organization or the special interest groups or the conferences or whatever, you know, how is that, how does that help you to make a, and use policies and what do you need? Um, I'm going to turn to, Sanka and Harris to tell us if we can split up what we thought. Ideally, we would have three groups. And Pilar, uh, we're going to ask you if we can get people who want to go into a Spanish speaking group, if it's possible in the breakouts, for you to chair one and report back. <laughs> okay. And no then Sanka and I will do the others, and Anna and Lauren can go to whichever, whichever you like. Um, Sankar and Harris, tell us how it works, please. Uh, I think Harris should... Uh, uh... While we are waiting, perhaps I will do something that we will do later till the guys have come back to tell us how we can do this. You know, if you don't already know, we have a special interest group in Wonka, 
policy advocacy group and we have a membership portal and you can come there and share ideas share resources we will point post the link to the webinar when it's the recording is uploaded and we also discuss you know conferences or ideas or whatever there is also a policy advocacy group in wonka europe um who we liaise with a lot and are co-learning from wonka europe often sets up its own groups but a lot of their leaders are in our group and vice versa. So there's plenty of opportunity for people to explore with colleagues, you know, the issues that have raised today. Sorry, Sanka and Harris now. Hello. Hello. We join now, the third group, we join now. Yeah, we're all back, I think. And some people I know will have left for other commitments or, it, you know, they've had it too long or whatever, that they heard the speakers. Often people will divide it like that. That's fine. Um, shall we have brief summary from each group? And then, as I said, I'll invite our two panel speakers to comment and close. Um, yeah, so from my group, very briefly, uh, group one, we had an example of a, if you like, a new policy um, approach and Maud is putting the um, topic of their a webinar that they're going to be running um, into the chat in case people want to join that. But we talk about the build of a new policy again as the others said earlier the sort of enthusiasts the people who've got the vision the innovators who understand the case for something and then you know testing it through learning conversations for example in wonka conferences or through a publication or through having a consultation with members and then bringing it more formally to executives in their own place or academies or regions or indeed to Wonka exec. And we also talked about the challenge of the use of language so that sometimes one has to make a compromise and leave a, a really classic term out, but when is that okay and when is it not? And we also use the example of family medicine getting, you know, oh, it's primary care. Well, sometimes we feel, no, if you don't say family medicine, people forget about our specialty. But then in other situations, you sometimes have to be pragmatic and hope that the concept is going forward in a document or a policy, even if the particular words are not. And then we also talked about different stakeholders needing to have different voices and different terminology. So if it's a financial stakeholder, you don't only want to talk money, but they will want to talk predominantly about costs, human costs, financial costs, whatever. And so you have to translate your message without losing the principle behind it. And then I think uh, Zhao reminded us that in Sydney, we discussed about trying to build some of this learning into a toolkit so that we, the SIG and Wonka, would also take some of these very, you know, important ideas to into a sort of how to do it kit. So we mustn't forget about that. Thank you. Is that OK, my group? Anything you want to add? Right. OK. No, um, I've, got, I've got to go and get my cable, uh, my computer wants, so please carry on. Okay, uh, I will present uh, from the group two. Uh, we had six participants from Argentina, Indonesia, Norway, and the USA and Sri Lanka. Um, so we, we uh discuss about two main uh things one is about the challenges around uh when we when we go ahead with the uh, policy advocacy i mean advocating and uh, we're going to um, materialize new idea etc so one thing is we we thought the first one of the most important thing is uh is the courage 
we need to have to go ahead with such an idea. And we also discuss about um, the challenges like uh, uh, the, the policymakers. Uh, I think this was discussed before as well, like how policymakers are reluctant to uh, discuss these things or to take up these things. Um, so uh, this was discussed in detail. And with that, we went into another important thing. We were thinking and we were discussing about the power of small groups. Because we discussed, we thought uh, we can think big, but then we have to start sometimes small. Otherwise, we can never start. So when in so uh, especially Larry pointed out how the how how small groups are really helpful, and how small groups can do wonders, uh, because it's very difficult sometimes to find out like-minded people, but when you have a small group, at least a few people with you, you definitely know these people are with me, and we can start something uh, confidently with these people. So. So this, the, the, the power of small groups and also the right mix in those groups, the gender mix and the, uh, the, the different ages, the, uh, younger people and more experienced, not, not so young people as well. Because uh, we can, I mean, we can, exp I mean, we can see that importance of uh, sharing experience. Now we can see how many were interested to join this webinar to listen to others' experience. So experience is very important because most of the things, most of the problems come to us is not new problems. They have been answered before in different ways. So we discussed the, the importance of having small groups with right mix, mixture with gender and age. So, uh, so these are the main things we discussed and also uh, which is, we, we, we touched about uh, uh, the, the uh, importance of giving this idea of evidence-based policy making and advocacy to our younger generation. I, uh, in this case, I really liked how uh, Lorraine approached uh, that with uh, the slide with where she compared uh, family medicine training and policy work. I think that's a great slide. I mean, uh, that is a very, very interesting slide. I think uh, because this is an easy way we can instill the importance of policy advocacy to our younger generation. So these are the main things we discussed. Uh, yeah. Great, thank you. Um... Oh, lots of stuff. And Pilar, please, group three. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we were seven people, uh, Chile, Argentina, Portugal, Ecuador, and as well, uh, Lauren, that has a wonderful Spanish, <laughs> Lauren, right? So she she's able to help me on the summary. We talked mainly um, about uh, how to raise awareness on what is primary health care both in civil society and uh, on the politician level. Uh, and uh, we, we share different experiences. Margarita from Portugal said that now they do not have enough family doctors. Then the citizens ask for uh, a family doctor. They, they now uh, are asking more than ever to have a family doctor for their home. So the scarcity give us uh, a role. <laughs> And then, um, well, Lauren uh, shared um, uh, really interesting experiences regarding um, to raise the awareness of those those politicians who have an experience with family doctors. If they themselves, they have been, they have a family doctor and their families along their lives, and uh, to highlight this role, and as well to uh, leverage the experience of family doctors and patients uh, about primary health care. She, she can share with us uh, the experience of um, California uh, project, um, a foundation of patients for primary care. Please, um, Lauren. 
Yes, no, thank you, Pilar, for that great summary. Um, one of the, the questions that we discussed that was raised by Mariano, which was a really, really important one, is to advance primary care among our elected officials that may not have a personal uh, experience with primary care or a high quality experience um, with primary care. And how do you bridge, um, bridge that um, gap? And that certainly has been my personal experience. Um, when I think of high quality primary care, I think of Dr. J.R. Paulson, who delivered me and took care of me until I was 18 and left for college and just retired this summer as my parents' primary care physician. Uh, that's a pretty singular experience that I am sadly discovering in my policy work. And how we you know, finance and pay for healthcare services in the U.S. is just stupid, beyond complex, and it is so mind-boggling. And so when I find myself in these rooms with policymakers uh, and politicians and trying to advocate for those changes, I'm increasingly realized I have to start with some very basics because they don't even understand what I'm talking about, about high-quality primary care and family medicine. And so a couple of the suggestions that we talked about is to identify those politicians that have had high quality family medicine or primary care experiences and elevate them to share their stories and to be advocates and voices for that. In addition to um, patient and physician dyads sharing their story and talking about longitudinal relationships can also be really powerful. And the third suggestion that we talked about, and I put this link in, in the chat, which is my colleague, Dr. Kevin Grumbach at University of California, San Francisco, has created an organization, um, very much grassroots at this point, called Patients for Primary Care where they're identifying patients that have had amazing primary care experiences and are asking them to share their thoughts. And um, this group is creating um, short and longer um, YouTube videos of their experiences. And these stories are really, really powerful. And again, patient-centered you know, family medicine, patient-centered policy work, um, these are really um, important voices that could be elevated um, in conversations, especially if it's someone, a conversation with a politician in which they are a voting constituent, that is also very powerful. So those are some things that we that we uh, talked about. But um, if there's a policy urgency or an emergency, in my mind, particularly in the U.S. context, it is the dearth of understanding of high quality primary care and family medicine and I am very, uh, that keeps, that's what keeps me up at nighttime is how to bridge that gap before we even get to, we need to improve how we finance infrastructure to support primary care. And like, you don't even have that conversation or it's going to be harder to have it because there's some basic understanding that we don't have first. So that's the explanation for the, the link that's in the chat. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, so, Lauren, I don't know if that counts as your summary of the event as a whole, but I'm going to let you yeah. have a think about that and take a breath and turn to Anna, please, to just give us some final observations or thoughts to take away with us after this very rich, very long session. So thank you. First of all, thank you. It's been it's been a great session. I really enjoyed it. And I think we have a lot to build on. It shows we have a lot to build on, not least. We have a global community. We are on different stages in building primary care and family medicine. And we have different um, levels of resources to do extensive policy or advocacy work. But we can, if we keep it small and simple, kiss. We can also learn from each other and support each other in this. I, I, I'm sure we can. Um, so let that be. Be I'm and and also of course it goes without saying. But you have to believe in what you're doing. I mean, passion is everything. Passion is maybe a. Well, I'm not a native English speaker, but you need to be passionate about if you you really you really feel for this. 
and if you're passionate and 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 persistent, then um, it will have it will have an impact. So good luck to every every one of us, I would say, and thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Lauren, is there anything else you would like to add? Yeah, a couple of thoughts. Um, the first is I am incredibly impressed with the policy and advocacy acumen of this group. Uh, you know a lot more than maybe you think you know, so give yourself a lot of credit. And, um, you know, Sanka, I'm glad to hear that that slide resonated with you um, in terms of family medicine or or primary care training experiences in your clinical work. There's there's so many skills that we know as clinicians that translate so beautifully to the policy realm. So while there will be a learning curve, it may not be as great as what you think it is because you're starting from a really great place. And given the incredible relationships we have with patients, those are beautiful stories that we can elevate to, to tackle all these um, challenges that we would like to like to tackle. So. That's one. And the second thing is, um, I, hopefully it's obvious, I love love policy. When I think about all the ways I'd love to change how we organize, deliver, and finance uh, family medicine and, and primary care, policy is a really powerful upstream tool to change the systems in which we provide care to make it work better for us and our colleagues on the clinical side and for patients and families. And so um, I invite you to join those of us that love policy work and don't be scared of it. It's so much fun. It's super frustrating many much of the time, but it's also um, a lot of fun and really powerful and exciting when you can make change happen because you can impact um, the lives of hundreds of patients and family members um, through policy work. So join us on the policy side. Amanda, may I just add one thing? Because um, we, and it's in line with, with what's said here, we should not forget that policymakers and politicians, they are also people. They are the same kind we see in our surgeries. Mm -hmm. They have the same problems. They have the same challenges mm -hmm. with their children, with their old parents. I mean, so we can, we can, we, we can also mobilize the family doctor in, in ourselves, in the policy dialogues. Yeah. That's all. Thank you. Well, that's a beautiful note to end on. Thank you both. I'm going to hand to Sanka, actually, to um, formally close the webinar, if that's all right. Thank you very much, Amanda. I think uh, that was a great session. I think I really enjoyed it. Uh, shared your wisdom and just as someone has told thank you for your wisdom and friendship we are wonka family of course yes i echo that and uh thank you very much for joining i think thank you very much our speakers anna and lauren for your kindness to attend and to, and for sharing your experience the policies that worked and giving us courage to go ahead to realize that yes, things work, things have worked. So we also can do that. And also some other senior colleagues and also junior colleagues who shared their views, experience. That was a great session. And we would like to see you again soon in a couple of months. And uh, I also invite you to join the, uh, if you are interested to join the Wonka special interest group on policy advocacy and share your thoughts with us. So thank you very much. And we the, the recording will be available on Wonka YouTube soon. And I hope our experiment worked, the translation worked. Uh, I can get more feedback from my friends <laughs> with the list. And uh, we will go ahead uh, uh, with the same in future. Thank you very much, Harris, for uh, the test session yesterday and for hosting today. More, more. I mean, relieving me from the most of the technical work. And thank you, Pilar, for the translations. And thank you all for attending. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye bye. Bye. -bye.
Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.